Hello, this is David Rovix with another live streamed discussion with a person of interest. If everything is running smoothly, we are broadcasting right now on YouTube, Facebook, Periscope, Twitch, LinkedIn, and VK. The show will be archived on all those platforms afterwards. And soon after the broadcast is over, you'll be able to find it as an audio podcast if you search for This Week with David Rovix on any podcasting app or at davidrovix.com. Today, we spend the hour with Margot Black. We're talking to each other from our respective residence, residences in this time of pandemic, but we are both here in the city of Portland, Oregon, where we have both lived for a long time. Margot and I have a lot else in common. We both have children, and we both have spent years attempting to raise our children while in a state of constant housing insecurity, never knowing when the landlord will again raise the rent uh, an unsustainable amount every year. To the extent that residents of Portland have more rights as renters than people do in the rest of the state of Oregon, with what few rights we have were won in struggle by Margot and others organizing under the banner of Portland Tenants United, a group which Margot formed along with other great folks. But while PTU's efforts have improved life for many people in Portland, the city, like so many others throughout the U.S., is a divided and stratified place, and it continues to get more divided and more stratified every year. As a result of the constant rise in the cost of housing, the city of Portland lost more than half of its African-American population in between the last two censuses. You can be sure that if anyone were keeping track of statistics on how much of the working class in general we were losing, very much including Portland's much vaunted, rapidly shrinking community of artists and musicians, you can be sure the statistic would be similar. So, with the support and encouragement of many people from around here, Margot Black is running for Portland City Council. The real estate developer house flipping establishment will be throwing everything they have at keeping Margot out of the city council, and they will be trying hard to prevent Chloe Udaly from keeping her seat. But if Chloe can keep her seat and Margot wins this election, Portland stands to have a renter and pro-renter, pro-human, pro-working class, pro-so-called middle class majority for the first time ever. Margot Black, welcome to my little live stream show. Um, Good morning. Be Thank you. Before we dive into politics and social change, I just <laughs> would ask, how are you holding up? You're at home with kids who are not in school and are probably flipping out along with the rest of the kids in society. Tell me, how, how are you doing? Uh, yeah, so the kids, my kids split their time between their dad and myself. Um, and uh, both of us, uh, you know, their dad is a uh, professor, so he has to do a lot of online teaching right now and, and I'm campaigning. So I'm doing a lot of this and a lot of research and advocacy and, and, uh, and they are, um, yeah, they're like, you know, when we use that cliche bouncing off the walls, that's like actually happening. <laughs> they're, you know, they're just they really home. do bounce, right? Yeah. Bounce, and yeah. they, you know, like during summer break, which would, which is what this is the closest, you know, they can see their friends, you know, we can do, we can go camping, we can go out into the world. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, we do have a park where they can, um, you know, run off some steam uh, nearby. But, uh, but yeah, we, you know, we have a, a small place and I, um, my, I have a housemate and we feel definitely like we have to spend most of our time um, uh, confined in these four walls. And, um, between the bouncing off them and, um, my kids are 10 and 12, so they don't know like where, um, trash bins are yet or like the, you know, they don't know where the sink is to do dishes. Um, I guess that's like something you learn in high school or something. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it seems if then, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have taught them these things. I'm just, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> being a little honest about the uh, tornado of of <laughs> garbage around the house. I, I know they say that with with parenting, the children sort of uh, you need to be a good model, and then they imitate. But if you're a good model and you're cooking all the time, how does that work? You know, then when do they start cooking? You know, I, I never uh, I never really figured that one out. Yeah. Yeah, um, I, there, there are definitely things I model much more than they emulate, but. Um. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I my first uh, the first subject I, I would like to explore here um, is is also very personal, but also very uh, very much related to your campaign. Um, my landlord is a corporation called the Randall Group, who owns a CTL Management, the sub corporation that collects mm -hmm. the rent here. Uh, they have more than doubled the rent since we moved in in 2007. They raise it every year. But somehow or other, I was still shocked when I received another rent increase for 2020, dated March 25th, weeks after the country shut down, the economy was crashing and everybody was losing their jobs. Um, just, uh, I, I just want to hear what you have to say about that. This is the Randall Group. That they own hundreds of properties up and down the West Coast. So we, what we can be sure of is that I was only one of thousands of people receiving such notification. Yeah, and actually, I, I think we've already talked about this. <clears throat> they were my former landlord um, oh, yeah. in the last apartment complex I, I lived in. Um, and so I was, I'm just, I'm, first, I'm just curious, are you month to month or is your lease mm -hmm. coming up and they gave you a lease change um, rent increase? It's. I think it's technically called a month to month lease, but they still okay, give you okay. three months notice before they increase the rent. So this was a yeah, increase well they, yeah. for July. Yeah. They, they have to do that. I was just wondering right. um, if, because uh, I want to now, I want to talk to my other Randall friends and find out if they all got rent increases. But if what the way one of the ways that they can make it a little bit less agitational in terms of an organizing thing is by you know if everyone's on a lease, then they're just on. Nobody's getting them all at the same time is what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. I was curious if you're month to uh, month, they're all good. Okay. Anyway, let's talk about the fact that on March 25th, you got a rent increase notice, um, which is, I mean, and you're not the only one. Um, I've heard of a, a lot of other management companies doing that. Um, uh, I heard that mainlander property management maybe sent out a rash of 9.9% .9 rent increases, which is the cap now that we have statewide um rent control, quote unquote. <laughs> um, quote unquote, uh, it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's it's funny because you would, you know, in this moment right now, you would think if we didn't have rent control, would they be raising the rent by more than 9.9% or, uh, or would they do a little bit more reflection and think, wow, uh, this is probably the worst time ever to raise the rent. I should, you know, I shouldn't do it very much, but maybe they're doing 9.9 .9 just because the state has basically said, that's a completely reasonable annual increase, 9.9%, right? And they're just right. like, well, we're just doing, we're just doing the thing the state told us to do. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, the state absolutely could have um, when they did their, the, so the Governor Brown did her first eviction moratorium on, I want to say March 22nd. Um, and that was like garbage. Um, all it did was kept the sheriff from coming, but your landlord could still put a 72 hour notice on your door, could ch still charge a late fee, could still file an eviction. So on April 1st, she put in a stronger executive order that um, basically made it so that um, nobody has to pay rent. And now it's still accrues, it's still due um, because they uh, are, you know, our, our policymakers are living in a fantasy world where um, as soon as we start working again, you know, the money will just roll in you know like it was before <laughs> yeah, oh yeah it we'll was be able to pay our, yeah, right. our regular too well. high rent right. and we'll be able to pay our back rent that we couldn't pay exactly. and we'll be able to pay our increased rent <laughs> yeah you know? in, in a society where 40 percent of people are not able to come up with 400 dollars, according to some recent often right. quoted oh. statistic yeah it's, um, I mean, this has been something that's been printed, you know, every year for the last, uh, you know, several years. It's that most Americans, if they have a financial emergency <clears throat> that necessitates them to come up with, yeah, like $400, you know, is there somebody you could call if your life depended on it kind of thing? Most of them can't. Yeah. Um, and meanwhile, yeah, we're, we're like, yeah, the rent is still due. You're just going to have some time to pay it. <laughs> uh, that's not going to work. So, um, she could have, you know, the state could have um, absolutely could have said no rent increases, you know, until further notice or whatever. Um, and there is a law, uh, the, the, so there's a ban on local rent control in the state of Oregon, um, which is, I think, 35 or 37 states also have, um, which means like Portland isn't allowed to do its own rent control. But there is... Um, in, the, in that statute, uh, there's a section that says in a time of natural or man-made disaster um, that local jurisdictions can enact 
rent control and it has to be lifted after an, or it has, you know, can only be temporary. It has to go away when the emergency order goes away. And they did this, you know, I'd like to believe that in uh, 90, whatever, when they, 92 or three, was it 82 or three, 82 or three, when they um, put the ban in on rent control, um, <clears throat> that that little emergency clause was, you know, for times like this, right? Uh, they, they were contemplating sort of like major economic shocks, but they, but the language says that it has to result in a material elimination of the rental housing supply. So they're thinking bombs, fires, floods. Uh, and I'm, and meanwhile, we're talking about this as like a, you know, a wartime situation. Yeah. Right? I think the pandemic counts as bombs, fire, flood. Yeah. That's I, I mean, I also thing. think so. But that's Act literally the excuse that the mayor and our current city council are making. They're like, it's illegal. And I'm like, but you can shut down the economy. You know, <laughs> you can, but, you can tell us that we have to stay in our homes and not this? work, but you can't, um, you, you know, you, you can't enact emergency rent control. And all we'd be asking for is that you say you can't increase the rent during the pandemic. The <laughs> there's a fear. There's a fear among the political class, like people like Ted uh, Wheeler. They, they, I think there, there's a there's a fear. I mean, I think it, it seems like first of all, what's happening with uh, shutting down the economies of the much of the world in order to save a certain percentage of people. To me, that that I'm I'm shocked that the capitalist class was even capable of of uh, doing. Me that. too. No, me too. Yeah. But then, but the it, fact is, but then they did it. But then they're they like, oh, it. but we can't. What we cannot do is say that the rent can't go up. <laughs> like that's out right. of our hands. Right, <laughs> right. Which is like, okay, amazing. if we can shut down the economy, that's the, the next step. Of course, it, part of this process is doing things like what you're talking about, like like uh, saying the rent can't go up, or even that the rent has to go down. But then the idea that politicians actually have the power in a democracy to say that the rent has to stop going up, or that the rent has to be cut in half, which they do have the power to do. This is a democracy. Mm -hmm. We do there. There is. They do have the power to do that kind of thing on a federal level or, or on a state level not I, I don't know about municipal well but, that's where I'm, I mean this is where my legal my you know expertise uh, is not complete like I mean at the con at the federal constitutional level there's like illegal takings or something right and that's because we because property rights are so sacrosanct here mm. um, and if you know you could sell something for ten dollars the government can't tell you that you could sell it for eight I mean I'm not I, I this is something I mean, that I is, should learn more about. I, I don't know. But again, it's hmm. like, you know, all of those things, I just feel like everything is, you know, um, it's all on, on the, the table. Yeah, right. It's all on the table. And yeah. what we do know <laughs> is that in other countries, in many European countries yeah. right now, they yeah. have they have uh, stopped rent, stopped mortgages. It's yeah. all been uh, all the mortgages have been deferred and the rent has been mm -hmm. suspended. And of mm -hmm. course, we also know that in other countries they are, you know, they have laws like uh, you can't own more than one or two houses. You can't you can't be a landlord in many countries. It's not even a, a possible thing to have a career as as a landlord. Uh, this is just mm -hmm. a. a is not not a not one of the options uh, in terms of what you making money off of people's need for housing you know there are different models of society it can be done differently and this one can be done differently governments mm -hmm. do have mm -hmm. power it and their power w whether it says so in the constitution or not uh, you know in, in a democracy we can amend the constitution we can actually yeah. get, the congress can amend the constitution so whatever it says in the constitution this can be amended we you know it it is a potentially functional democracy right but but so it seems also like just talk I mean, mm, here's yeah. one of my favorite pieces of this is, yes, we could amend the Constitution. Um, we could make declarations. Um, and, and you know, we should. Uh, let's be clear about that. Um, but, uh, you know, the last, like during the last, you know, in the last uh, big um, rent crisis, you know, where rents were going up, Two, three, four, five hundred dollars. Um, you know, in 2015, 16, 17, 18. Um, <clears throat> uh, when we would complain about that, the you know landlords and the economists and the real estate, you know, the capitalists would come back and and say, um, well, just whatever the market would will bear. You know, if you don't like it, get a better job, move to a less expensive city. You know, save better, stop eating avocado toast. Um, so that you know, the premise there is that. Uh, you know, somebody else will rent that housing for way too much. And so, you know, go off and find um, something that you can afford. So if, if, uh, 
if our assumption is that the market is setting these rents, then 40% unemployment, you would think, would drive the rents down, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the fact is, is like, we can't pay those rents anymore. That's exactly why we're not paying them. And yeah. so now, invisible hand, what say you? <laughs> you know, like, isn't this when the rents are supposed to come down? And then my favorite part is now the landlords will be like, but our bills. You know, That's what um, or saying. Our mortgage. They wrote me uh, a letter uh, saying uh, when I when I I wrote them an open letter to my landlord, which which I which I also put out on uh, Counterpunch and other mm -hmm. places. But mm -hmm. but uh, they uh, I'm sure they didn't actually read the letter. If you know uh, whoever whoever they are, you know. But right. some some bureaucrat at CTL management uh, did respond to the letter by sending uh, information uh, to to me and presumably other people about how we can apply for unemployment uh, benefits and uh, and I just wonder and I, I really wanted to write them back and say well yeah this two trillion dollar corporate bailout that's coming in is mostly going to corporations like you guys randall group and so mm -hmm. why don't you tell why don't you uh, get some government money and uh, and stop asking me to pay the rent uh, that that, that mm -hmm. i can't afford that nobody can afford these days yeah it's um and these unemployment benefits i mean i know people who were furloughed or laid off in the very first days they're still not getting their unemployment um you know, payments. And then mm. you have all the people, I mean, and I know that unemployment has been expanded to meet more job sectors, which is good. Um, but there are still tons of, you know, holes that people fall through. Um, and, and, and then folks, uh, you know, anybody working under the table, um, or like long term unemployed who had like different, you know, different little hustles, mm -hmm. uh, but got, you know, kicked off unemployment, a while ago, um, you know, they can't get back on up at all that, you know, all those hustles have evaporated as well. And, uh, and then most importantly, um, you know, undocumented folks. Yeah. 11 and million folks, undocumented people who have no option of getting on unemployment. And yeah. So and many these of are people getting who, sick. They, they're getting sick. You know, they, they own um, businesses that provide incredibly, uh, you know, incredible value to our communities. Like, food carts, um, uh, housekeeping, they help, you know, they, they produce uh, and bring to market a huge amount of our food. And, um, and we're just like, yeah, sorry, like you get no small business, per, you know, protections, you get no unemployment um, and, and no stimulus check. And, uh, and, you know, I, I'm sure that among the un undocumented population, uh, a huge proportion are uh renters yeah. um and their income almost is all. just yeah, just sure. zero yeah i'm sure yeah i'm sure almost yeah. all um and their income is zeroed out and uh and they have larger families some of them and i mean i think this is and this is a humanitarian crisis that we're going to see the chickens coming home to roost uh real soon you know, um, if we don't address this. And so for landlords, I mean, so you said apply for unemployment. I'm seeing other landlords write letters saying Safeway and Albertsons and Amazon are hiring. Um, put it on a credit card. Yeah, that's what they said to me. Put it on a credit card. Do they not understand uh, how bad the economy was doing for so many people before? Like, I mean, and do I they, do know. they, you know, like what, what I wonder about is, is, uh, I mean, the, the nature of the sort of, the way that these these corporations like CTL Management, the Randall Group, Prime, how they actually operate, like how it is that you could actually do a rent increase, uh, like that, like I mean, is there anyone actually thinking? Is there anyone in the process? You know, because at some point you'd think some corporate executive would be like, "Oh, wait a sec! If I do this and other people do this, we might actually foment a revolution in this country." We I mean, this that. is what I'm wondering, right? I'm like, yeah. wow, you guys are really like, like how stupid are the room? <laughs> really? I mean, read the like, graffiti. The like, walk I've around the like, sea. It says rent strike everywhere. I know. And I mean, national and international headlines are calling yeah. for a rent strike. Yeah. And they're like, time for the 10% rent increase. And yeah. like, what's the, the cognitive dissonance there? I mean, yeah. I'm like, do you think we're lying? Do you think we're sitting on piles of money? Like, you know, right. I think we're just like unwilling to give it to you. Like I it's, know people who like are paying natural... their rent before their food and they will yeah. continue to do and that they, that's until they have no money. 
you know? Right. And and what do you have to say to people like that? Because that's a lot of people, Margot. There's a lot of people who are feeling uh, like, and, and I've been having so much contact with them because, uh, you know, as you know, I write a lot of songs uh, on this subject and I get a mm -hmm. lot of comments on YouTube uh, from, from people who are suffering all over this country. And you know, there are, but there are a lot of people uh, who, I mean, they weren't looking for this kind of music. They came to it because of the circumstances. Mm -hmm, they find mm -hmm. the songs. They find them to be, you know, reassuring that somebody else is thinking about <clears throat> their situation. But what I'm, what I realized is that there's just so many people out there who feel so guilty that they mm -hmm. can't pay the rent, and they, mm -hmm. like because they feel it. I think they feel like there's something equitable about this system, and they're not playing the game correctly. And what do you have to say to those people? You know, I don't know that um it's guilt so what i in so i've been organizing with tenants for the last five years and we've done a few um rent strikes and we have well a couple rent strikes and we've talked about many others and um and and one of the reasons that you don't see me right now shouting rent strike from the roof um first of all i want to say i am like when ptu formed it was all about um leveraging our collective power to pay the rent to, you know, affect our material conditions. And my fantasy then and still now is a real citywide tenants union with like real density, you know, um, thousands, if not tens of thousands of us um, who all through like an organized democratic process, you know, vote to strike and withhold our rent. And <clears throat> um, now we've tried this. So I'm, so I'm just trying to say I'm like all rent strike all day, every day, you know, um, but I have been a little bit more careful about that in this environment because, you know, first of all, there's a difference between I'm not paying my rent in order to meet, you know, to, to um, win my militant demands and I can't pay my rent because I lost my job. Um, and I, and I'm just saying that the organizing conditions are a little different, right? Yeah. yeah. Not it's, that, it's more like a de facto, know. it's a de facto. It, rent yeah, right? exactly. As long as evictions are suspended, but at the end of 90 days, it's I've, what I've been saying. And I don't know, it seems to me like three months uh, suspension on evictions. Any, if you're not paying the rent, it's sort of like a practice rent strike. It's, it's, it's like yeah. a, a game almost And at the end of the 90 yeah. days, then it's real, you know, but no, that's uh, true. You know, people I've been ending my broadcast often by saying, don't pay <laughs> the rent because well, people are living in places that don't have, uh, that have a suspension on evictions you know there's no real danger in, in encouraging well, them right, not right, to pay the rent right. in at the end of june then it's a whole different story depending on what's happening by then but it's um it's fear so so yep. even when like so the one of the last buildings i was organizing with in in oregon um if your landlord isn't uh fixing things fast enough or your places become uninhabitable for various reasons and you've communicated with them and they're not you it is your uh, you have power legal power to withhold your rent. You have to do it in a, you know, you have to check a couple boxes to inoculate yourself from eviction, but it's like the way you get your day in court. You withhold your rent, then your landlord sues you for eviction, and then you go to court and you're like, well, I wasn't paying my rent because they weren't fixing the toilet. And the judge is like, okay, um, then you, even if the judge disagrees, even if the judge is like, well, you only gave them like two days to fix the toilet, you should give them a week. Um, so you have to pay your landlord back that rent. I mean, that's just one of the possible outcomes, but you won't be evicted for it, right? That's kind of like the little, the game. You're allowed to withhold the rent to get your day in court and you'll be protected from eviction. Even in those cases, which is what the last building we had, every, um, I mean, we were demanding months of back rent and other things, um, but they, and they were still living in very uninhabitable conditions. And I started saying like, we know you guys, you can just stop paying and we can do this in an organized you know, way. And, um, and even after like months of organizing there and lots of education and agitation and people with good politics, you know, I just remember the, the, the first woman who responded to this, you know, in, we were actually having an in-person meeting because this was back in the old days when you could do that. Um, you know, she was like, oh no, like I've got kids. I'm not taking that risk. Like no way. And it's just, it's, it's such you know, we have lived in this, if you don't pay the rent, you will be evicted and your life will be like effectively, you know, destroyed for years to come. We've been in this, um, you know, psychological relationship with our landlords for our yeah, whole lives. Our whole and life. even me, so I couldn't pay my rent this month. Um, I haven't been, uh, you know, 
go to work, get paid um, employed for a, for a little while. And, um, and I have had kind of little pockets of things that I have been able to get me through. But I, when I decided to run this campaign, it was, I had a very small employer retirement fund from my last job that could basically get me through the end of my campaign. Um, before I'd have to, you know, hopefully I'll get this job. And if I don't, then I am screwed. But, you know, the stock market went nuts. And so I lost basically like two months of bills, which is a big deal because I only have a very <laughs> small amount. And so I talked to my landlord and um, and she and I have, um, as you might imagine, a little bit of a uh, antagonistic <laughs> relationship. <laughs> I'm not, you know, I don't like that because I, you know, it's stressful, right? <clears throat> yeah. Um, and I basically just told her that I wasn't going to pay, even though I could in the sense that, remember, I'm not, you know, I, I'm just dipping into a retirement account, right? And it's like mm. the account is smaller, but mm. there is still money in it. And so it's a really, for me, it's a difference of not paying now or not paying later, right? Yeah. And so, um, and so I, first, I just kind of tried to like, I really just was like, my house, the house I live in is paid off. So my rent, which is yeah. enormous, goes right in her pocket. Yeah. And, um, and, and I was basically trying to like reason with her and, and I first suggested, can I just pay a thousand? Cause I have a housemate. And so we would, you know, that we could get away with that. And she said, no. And so I was like, all right, well, I'm just not going to pay then. And, but then on the fourth, when like rent was due, I was really gripped with anxiety and yeah. it wasn't like, is she going to evict me? Because I, you know, I have, I know how to, you know, do you play that game or whatever? Mm. But it was like the, you know, is is the is the government going to come through? You know, is this going to get waived? Like, am I going to be on the hook for you know eighteen hundred dollars later when I'm going to be able to afford it even less? Yeah. And yeah. you know, and it was just it was just it wasn't guilt, not not a not a, a hair of guilt. It was just anxiety when it actually came down to not paying. Of like, I you know, like, am I? am I being really reckless right now? And this is going to like really yeah. screw up my life later. Yeah, it's and fear because I mean, of course the, the, yeah. uh, the, in, in, uh, as they often will talk about like, not that who's they, the, 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 the capitalist class, the ruling class, the, the ideologues that write the textbooks, the, uh, the, these people love to talk about contracts and about agreements between mm -hmm. parties. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and there's this, there's this mm -hmm. assumption as we know, anybody who's gone to high school in this country knows there's this <clears> assumption in the, in this whole, all this talk about contracts that we, that it's, it's nonsense of course in reality because there, there is no equal uh, parties in these contracts right mm -hmm. and uh, and when, when we're talking about a contract between a landlord and a tenant the landlord has the power to evict the tenant so there, there's nothing equal mm -hmm. about this contract but but there the, the at the same time there is there's such a relevant uh, it's such a relevant concept because in terms of agreements between parties because when we're talking about the landlords they are actually in, at, at least certainly in the case of the big ones and also the little ones can take advantage of the big ones uh, tendency to fix the prices in the first place so the big ones mm -hmm, they fix mm -hmm. they fix the prices and this is an mm -hmm. agreement between landlords to keep the prices high and keep mm -hmm. houses off the market so it, so they don't mm -hmm. have to sell them too low because they want to make sure mark you know everything's as expensive as possible but then mm -hmm. people organizing a a union a, a tenants union is is basically considered to be a uh, an act of uh of some kind of like you know i don't know it, you know it, it, these people must not believe in private property is the idea that that you you that comes at us right it's like we're just a bunch of like i don't know you know it just insert expletive here you know some kind of like, <clears throat> And not just don't believe in it, but we also don't know how to take care of it. We don't know the value of it. You know, as we if, are like co housing lesser doesn't exist. People. As if there's yeah. no yeah, yeah, exactly. As if there's yeah. no such thing as a well run co housing unit, which you can find all over this country, all over Europe, all over the world. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, where they take mm -hmm. care of their houses much better than than some corporate landlord does. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. So so it's the it's you know, to get back to the like rent strike, I mean it, you you kind of brought up like the the militant tenants union. I mean, right now what I'm seeing is people who can't pay the rent, who have told their landlord they can't pay the rent, um, and uh and aren't and don't pay the rent. And then um maybe their landlord is saying like, okay, well, you know, it'll be due in six months. Maybe their landlord is is coming back with a, well, I'm gonna, you know, um I'm gonna 
do whatever I can to get it anyway. I mean, we've had landlords who are still trying to charge late fees and trying to post 72 hour notices or something in between, right? But here's mm. what those people are doing. They're moving out. Yep. Um, I'm hearing stories about people who just, you know, have been moving out of their apartments in the night. Where are they going? I don't know. Are they going to family? Are they going into their cars? But the, you know, the problem is, is that they don't even, um, they're just assuming, well, if I can't pay the rent and I'm not going to be able to pay it in six months. And, right. and so I'm, you know, what I'm really struggling with right now and what I think like in so many ways, this whole global economy coming to a screeching halt is, um, kind of the tenant organizer's dream, right? Like, well, we can't pay the rent. So if there was ever a better time for a rent strike, it's now. Well, the um, conditions, that that's part of it, right? The conditions have right. to be there. for People have to be desperate if they're going to be rent striking. That's clear. Right, but, but it's, right. But also but there we can't, has to be a certain We, we can't reach them. Point. We can't knock doors. We can't meet, right. you know? And, and that's what it's so... But people have to believe they might win, too, even if yeah. whether you can reach them or not. I mean, the, yeah. how, how do you convince people that victory is possible? How do, how do you convince people that this is not the way it has to be? There is nothing. God did not come down and say there's landlords and tenants. Right. Landlords right. and tenants exist only in our minds, and, and it's it's yep. something that is enforced by the police and by the law and mm -hmm. by the you know the mm -hmm. courts and everything else. But this is all mm -hmm. a figment of our imagination. There's nothing. There's no natural law that says somebody has to own land and somebody else has to rent it. Right. I've been trying to talk about that on the campaign trail in terms of like the laws of physics. You know, in terms of the things that we um, have control over and have no control over. You know, arbitrary or not arbitrary. And this whole right. relationship is arbitrary this is right. socially defined yeah this, this is not is not no, it is not gravity it is not god um and can we talk is, about yeah. your campaign by the way i think uh, we, sure. we need to, uh, yeah. yes. can you tell tell us <laughs> why, why are you running for city council and and what do you hope to accomplish if you get in and and do you, did you think my introduction was sort of accurate in terms of like what what could potentially happen if jane chloe and 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 you are all on the city council at the same time James, who's James? Hardest, hardest, hardest. Oh, hard, Joanne, Joanne. 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 Yes, right. yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, I, so first of all, I think the the potential composition of the council um, could be pretty powerful because it would uh, if Chloe wins, um, Joanne's already there. Um, if I win, and if uh, Sarah Ionarone can get um, Mayor Wheeler out, um, we'd have an all woman council because mm. the only possible contenders for Fritz's seat um, are two uh, Latina women. Um, and uh, uh, and so we'd have an all woman council and we'd have a very kind of progressive radical council, yeah. um, which would be amazing. Um, and it, I, it's hard to even wrap, like, I, I can't spend too much time thinking about that because it's like hard to wrap my mind around how amazing that would be. That would be it so would, amazing. You know, and of course, the, the yeah. establishment is trying to stop it from happening, you know, and, well, and, who, yeah. and we don't know where Ted, Ted Wheeler's money is coming from either. Right. That's that's a, a big well, mystery. Uh, 10,000 of it came from the realtors like last week. Is, so, that, is he admitting to that? Oh, it's reported. I mean, you have okay. to report okay. your campaign contributions. Right. Yeah. So it's reported. Yeah. yeah. He's not running, you know, he's not using the public financing. And sorry, can you hear the bing bing on my yeah, computer? It's, it's not too the but... notifications. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'll try to figure out how to turn them off, though. Um, it's no big deal. Uh, so I'm running, I mean, I'm running for a lot of these reasons we talked about. Um, when I went, so I'm running to fill a seat that was vacated by the untimely death of the, of Commissioner Fish. He died, um, I want to say December, very end of December or January 1st um, of stomach cancer. And, um, and he, so, so Chloe Daly has been um, a city commissioner that, that myself and Portland Tenants United um, worked really hard to get into office in 2016. And that's how we've won some major gains. And, and in renters rights and and so she has uh you know kind of an agenda that we're trying to see through and my first thought after um nick died not my first thought i actually was anyway i was very saddened by his death um but an early thought was oh my god what does this mean for our like agenda and i i reached out to um somebody in her office a friend of mine and and she was like this changes everything. I have no idea. So then I kind of started worrying a little bit about who might fill that seat. And then I, it was, wasn't long, you know, didn't, wasn't a huge stretch before I was like, Oh wait, I was going to run for this seat two years ago. I might as well just do it now. But then one of the first um, phone calls I made to just kind of uh, see what the temp would be. And it was, it's, you know, kind of from a political insider um, 
and he said, well, uh, you know, I, I really like the idea of you running for office, but, um, but hasn't, you know, Chloe already done like everything tenants rights? Like, uh, um, haven't we like done housing, you know? And I was oh like, Oh, God. that's why I need to run. Yes. Yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> Because, um, you know, because we think that and because like, yeah. because h- housing and homelessness are still the number one issues for Portlanders. And, you know, the most immediate reception to me announcing that I was running was, we don't need another single issue candidate. And I'm like, okay, first of all, I'm not a single issue candidate. Mm. Um, you know, I am very loud about housing and tenants rights, because there was a, a vacuum of, you know, there wasn't any, there, there wasn't another voice. Um, you know, but I've been fighting for economic and social justice my whole life. Um, and I have, you know, I'm not a one trick pony, but also, um, housing and homelessness touches every issue we care about. Um, the impacts of housing insecurity, uh, you know, are myriad and go well beyond, you know, just not having a roof over your head. Uh, Before the, the crisis, fact- they called it the crisis. Right. I mean, on the exactly, West Coast, if, right? when when people said the crisis, it, it was pretty clear. It, you know, maybe some people were talking about climate change or forest fires, but most people were talking about homelessness and housing. Right. Yeah. Right. And um, and so when people, you know, say we don't need a single issue candidate or we already have one tenants rights person, um, that's when I'm like this, you know, no, no renters are saying that. OK, <laughs> no one who is homeless is saying that no. nobody who, um, you know, even low income homeowners or, you know, any, anybody who has felt in any way the anxiety of, um, of you know, not knowing if they're going to be able to pay their rent or, or if they're going to still be in this neighborhood, you know, when their kids start school next year, whatever. Yeah. Um, none of them think that like housing and homelessness are fixed or that like housing and homelessness is like a single issue that we don't want a single issue candidate for. Right. And this is a mm-hmm. reflection of the fact that most of the people who hold power and control the like dominant messaging, um, you know, they haven't had to uh, worry about, you know, paying the rent in, in decades. I mean, these are no. people who still, you know, have these like romantic stories about moving into their first apartment that was like $150 a month and working a minimum wage job uh, and going to school and paying the rent. And, I still get know, these, and I, I get these lectures from, from people like my, my parents' a generation, you know, including I'd have to say my mother, you know, like she tells me about the rent control departments she lived in in New York City and how she paid for it and all that. And like, I, I just, I just, you know, I listen to these stories because that's what can you do? But it it's, was right. No parents. Yeah, you know? this has yeah. nothing to do with the current reality. And yeah. it, you know, and it's just it's this like avocado toast mentality that we're just yeah. you know like we'd be able to afford it if we just paid you know we just spent less money on avocado toast. So, I mean, what I've really noticed in the last five years, and I mean we know this, but this is just you know my own personal journey, is that the people in power are not the you know not the working class. Um, yeah. And. And it's been a you know very 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 long time since if 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 ever um, that they have had uh, they've lived you know working class lives or lived in the struggle and so even some of the people who you know I'd like to say are they're good people they mean well um, you know they try to like fight for the little guys um, but they just uh, you know they don't they they they're not living it and they don't no. have. Um, they don't have people close in their lives who are living it. And as a tenants rights organizer, you know, I have, <clears throat> you know, I have uh, l- like one of my kind of more radicalizing moments over the last several years was, um, you know, when I, uh, uh, it, it, there was some moment where I think it was actually when Randall gave, you know, a $180 rent increase or something mm. um, on our three bedroom apartment built in the forties or whatever that, uh, you know, it wasn't a slum, but it wasn't like $180 annual rent increase. You know? And it had <laughs> and been paid for decades ago. Yeah. And I was already sure. paying way more than I ever thought I would pay in rent and certainly to like live in a three bedroom apartment. Right. Mm-hmm. And I had a professional career. I was up at Lewis and Clark teaching math and, and running a, a skill center um, my husband at the time was a professor and we were still, you know, so, and, and neither of us come from any money at all. Um, and so, you know, this was like the, our peak, peak prosperity. 
and we couldn't, you know, and, and the rents were like skyrocketing and we already like weren't making it, you know, um, because of all the other things that cost money, childcare, health insurance, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and I was like, wow, am I, am I going to be like priced out of Portland? Cause I'd grown up, you know, my whole twenties was all about how expensive San Francisco was and New York and, and London or whatever. And these were like the cities that you could only move to if you were, um, single and, uh, you know, either had a really good hustle or, or were working on Wall Street or whatever, right? Or could share a room with 80 people and I couldn't because I've been a single mom since I was 19. But Portland was not that city, right? Portland was a city that you could still, you know, it just it just wasn't in that mythical, you know, that, that lore of expensive cities. So I was like, wow, am I going to be, am I going to be priced out? And then I looked at how much privilege I have, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I'm well-educated. I have a professional career. I was married. I'm healthy. I'm white. I'm able-bodied. Um, and I thought, wow, like, and like I said, peak, peak prosperity. Um, and I thought if I'm, <laughs> if I'm feeling this way, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, how's any, you know, how's anybody else making it? And, um, I forget where I think I feel like I went off on a, I lost my train of thought on that, but that was a radicalizing moment for me. No, that's, that, yeah. Um, Why you ended that, up running for office. Is, uh, yeah, yeah. It was part of it, you know, it was yeah. kind of like, what's, like what's happening here, you know, and, yeah. uh, yeah. things are really, things are really broken and, um, and nobody's talking about it because nobody's having that experience. And I think the fact that we, I mean, for the exact same reason that we're not calling for, uh, you know, that, that our city council isn't just enacting rent control right now, um, mm-hmm. or, you know, and, banging on the governor's door to, to, uh, you know, freeze rent increases is the same thing. It's just, it's just total out of touch. It's like, yeah, we, you know, it, it we can, in our, imagine, we been in our imagination, it? renters can do it. Well, are we I, demanding it? I mean, what, when, when you, when I have been as, you know, I've been to many Portland tenants in United rallies and, and uh, other uh, attempts at rallies in Salem and Portland, and, and we never have more than a hundred people at these rallies. And that is not a, uh, that is not a uh, reflection uh, actually of, of the really excellent organizing that you and a number of other people in PTU have done. I mean, with the amount of door knocking and the amount of work you guys have done in terms of communicating with local people, if the, you know there there should be many many more times people at those as many people at those protests and i you know i i think i already know the answer to this question but i want to know what you think why why do so few people come out what do they really just think that there's no potential possibility of 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 winning because there's no other cities where they're winning and so why would we win here well i think there's a lot of reasons i mean first of all uh getting turn out to Salem is just hard. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, why aren't people coming out? I think that it's, um, you know, I think that there definitely is for, for people who we haven't been able to like get to yet, they absolutely feel like there's no point. Like this is just the way it is. And this is the way it's always been. I mean, I remember, um, uh, somebody asking me a few years ago, um, I was getting prof- professional portraits taken for my job and we were chit chatting and I mentioned, you know, the rent or whatever. And he's like, you're a renter. And I said, yeah. And at this point I'm like, you know, 37 and again, I'm teaching up at a private college and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, what happened? And I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> it was yeah. like I failed at adulting. Um, and, and there's this real internalization that whatever is happening to you as a renter is mm. because you have failed to live the life that, um, we've all been, you know, told is, uh, is available to us if we just work hard, mm. um, and we've made bad choices and that's why we don't own houses. And mm. so we deserve what is coming to us. And this is, this just is the relationship. I mean, I know that I didn't know how, I didn't know change was possible five, six years ago. I mean, or I certainly didn't know how to do it. And I didn't know, you know, what the barriers were. Um, and I, and I definitely assumed that other people were working on it, you know, that right. I like, and I think there's a little bit of that is that, um, you know, our, my generation um, had kind of came of age, our generation came of age during the, you know, organizing wilderness right? Like Mm. the, the, the Reagan and Bush years, I mean, there's, there's been some anti-war, you know, and WTO protests and stuff like that. But, um, 
but we didn't, I didn't grow up, you know, in the sixties when, Mm. um, you know, change was happening all the time. And so we just don't, and then, and then the nonprofit industrial, you know, complex came in Mm. and said, here, we'll provide like a tiny bit of palliative care and a tiny bit of, you know, lobbying. And we'll ask for, you know, we need this. Sorry, I'm trying to see in the window. We need this. We'll ask for this. We'll be grateful for this. Um, And there's this whole like, well, it's just somebody else's job to be an activist. You know, people will tell me, I'm glad you're an activist. And I'm like, Mm. it's not a hobby. It's a responsibility. You know, (laughs) we all need to be doing it. And we just don't, you know, there's, there's apathy, there's apathy and alienation, a feeling that it just won't work. It can't work. Somebody else is doing it. You know, the nonprofits. Um, and then also just, you know, the, the, we're crushed by capitalism, you know, yeah. I mean, the people who, who are, you know, need this the most are they're the working two who, jobs. They're working two jobs. They've got kids, they've got sick kids, they're sick themselves, <clears throat> they're disabled. Um, you know, there's just, there's so many barriers. And so, you know, for every protest, for every city, city council meeting, for every Salem trip, I'll have, you know, what, for every one person I get there, I'll have 10 more say, I wish I could, but, you know, um, and, and it's hard, like, I, for me as an organizer, I want to be like, well, of course, we all do what we can when we can, and far be it from me to tell you that you, you know, need to take your time, time off work to, you know, to, and forego pay to come out and shout in the streets, you know, when we're not sure when or if something's going to happen. Um, on the other hand, I want to be like, look, we're not, you know, we, it, if, if we don't do it, then nothing's going to happen. Gonna win, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're not just going to give it to me if I ask nicely. Right? Yeah. And that's what makes it, you know. And then I feel like if we, you know, if we didn't have the social distancing, um, I think we'd just be, you know, uh, uh, burning down the castle right now or um, storming the castle. That's the word. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So you burn it down uh, after you storm it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and so it's really it's hard to like get us, you know, just having to do everything online. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm not trying to say it can't be done, but it does it really very difficult. How is that it going? Really, what? Yeah. Trying to like, just fit, you know, the effervescence of like getting all these people together to be like, yeah, we need this. It's just, you, it's really hard to do. But um, I think that there are probably, I, I don't know. I haven't like, you know, tried to look it up or anything, but I would guess that the, the term rent strike is being searched on Google <laughs> more than ever since Google's existed. And is, I imagine that yeah. this probably is resulting in some people finding about your campaign and finding out about Portland Tenants United. And is, yeah, is that happening United too? Has, yep. 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 Yeah. We've gotten new, we've gotten a lot more members. Um, right. and definitely a lot more interest. We're also getting, um, you know, the, the Facebook group has the Facebook page, um, has become kind of, you know, a nine one one for renters. Yeah. Um, I mean, there, and there's just, oh, there's just so many, so many evil landlords out mm. there, um, doing so many evil things. Mm. And it's been really hard because I feel like we're under a triage tent where right. we want, you know, we want to like ready for battle um and storm the castle but we're under a tree you know but there's all these people with like you know bleeding out yeah yeah too busy and trying so to what do you, people up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah. um and it's been it's been really hard um and the mm-hmm. left is just i don't you know in portland the left is kind of less united and organized than ever um yeah absolutely and and there's you know it it feels so incredibly um you know it felt like just needlessly frustrating and silly before coronavirus. But now yeah. I'm like, are you kidding? Are you like still fighting these faction fights? Like, do you mm. see what's happening right now? Yeah. You know? <laughs> like, no, this is even, like, even it's, Google it's and Apple are communicating waiting for, you know? It's, yeah, exactly. This is it. Yeah, yeah. this is it. Yeah. And, and now, yeah. And you can't, and, and don't be, don't be complaining about, uh, yeah. Faction like, stuff just, or, like, or, hold or your whether... nose and work together. Like, yeah, we, work together. We really... Can we... Yeah, like we really do actually want the same things, you know. Yeah, I, I would if if it's anything like past uh, moments of uh, when 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 there's suddenly uh, the possibility for a lot of uh, good organizing to take place, then there's uh, there's inevitably going to be people saying like, "Well, why didn't they join PTU before?" You know, like or, you know, whatever. That's yeah. the kind of well, stuff and people will say. Well, PTU's not saying you know? that. It's just, no. but then there's you know there's a uh, there's like uh, literally a single individual who started the. PDX rent strike. And um, I don't even know what her gripe is 
with me, but it is. Mm. And so, um, you know, so here I am running for office, the head of PTU. PTU has done, you know, the most militant and effective tenants' rights organizing, um, you know, in recent history on the, you know, in, in Oregon, certainly, if not the whole West Coast. And, uh, and she's holding, you know, and she's trying to convene a whole new effort where, and it's fine, like, I'm all for autonomous organizing, like, that's great. But like, really explicitly, like, Margot Black and PTU aren't allowed. And it's like, come, like, <laughs> bizarre. It's not like Margot Black or PTU need to be in charge, but it's like, really, like, this is the most important value to you right now. Like, That's this? so bizarre. Well, I mean, I, I would be surprised if they had <laughs> heard of Margot Black or PTU, because otherwise they might actually just join uh, with PTU. Because the rent strike oh, sure. uh, yeah, yeah. initiative that's happening all over the country and, all, and many other countries, it's like, it's a it's a very, it's a meme, it's a it's a concept, it's wonderful mm -hmm. that it's catching mm -hmm. on, it's an, it's an initiative that's not related to previous tenant organizing in many cases, but no, one, no, one would hope that it'll just uh, naturally hook in with, with real tenant organizing that's going yeah. on. Yeah. But in moments yeah. like these, what tends to happen in in uh, historically with with like big crises is the people who had been doing a lot of the organizing who had their ideas of what were realistic parameters for organizing before the crisis are the ones who don't uh, catch up to the current situation as yeah. fast as just regular people yeah. do. The regular yeah. people yeah. they got their their feet on the ground and and they know when it's time for yeah. uh, you know yeah yeah. 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 And that, you know, and that's something I'm kind of, you know, that's what's so exciting about all the autonomous organizing happening. It's like, you don't even need the, you know, the institutions necessarily because the people are just going to do it, you know, when the, when the, the match is thrown on the uh, fire, but. Then like they'll need see, organization think, though. At, exactly. at that point they need organization. And yeah. I think what I'd like to see, I think the most effective way to do this, if I might think out loud for just a second is that we really like you're in Randall and they have a few buildings and, and, you know, Rand, it's like Randall and Randall children's hospital, right? Like well, Randall. So they're Mr. And Mrs. Randall in 2011 donated $10 million to the uh, Emanuel children's hospital, which then uh, changed its name to Randall children's mm -hmm. hospital because of that donation. And mm -hmm. yeah, it is just like, uh, so they spent $10 million on that. Uh, and and that's lovely. I'm all for donating money to hospitals. But, you know, I think everybody it, it needs to understand where that money came from. That money came from evicting children from their houses. Yeah. And it came, yeah. And it came from like fleecing me for. Yeah. You kicking know, you and your kids out of your house. Raising mm -hmm, the rent mm -hmm, impossibly right, to the point yeah. where you can't pay it yeah. and doing it to a lots of other people. And they yeah. only stopped doing it over 10% raises when it was it, it became illegal to do that. Oh, and, I was mm -hmm. living in Randall when, when Relo passed and mm -hmm. they had already, uh, so I was in the middle of my lease. So I didn't get, a, I wasn't have, getting a rent increase, but one of my neighbors, um, like seven doors down, had gotten her rent increase letter and it had, you know, they had a different price for every like month long lease that you sign but the uh you know they want a time when your lease turns over so they don't have turnover at bad times so like certain leases were cheaper than and and like month to month was like a 700 hundred dollar increase or something like that uh and and then relo passed and and remember it passed and it was retroactive um for any notice that had already been issued and um, Randall, like the day after Relo passed, she got a new letter on her door that um, not only said disregard the previous notice, but said it, it had all the same lease terms and she could pick whichever one she wanted and none of, for zero rent increase for any of them. Like they just zeroed everything out in response and it was so beautiful. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and I mean, of course they didn't, you know, Stick with that. My next rent increase was considerably smaller. It was like $40. Um, so hmm. I feel like they, they got the picture, but, uh, but yeah, they were, you know, I mean, $700 to go month to month, um, which some people need, you know, for flexibility. Hmm. Uh, hmm. But I, so I'd like to see like Randall's a good one. And there's some, there's some other ones, especially, you know, there've been a few that have uh, Palisades property management is one where they're, the tenants are really are doing some property management based organizing, and I'm really excited that might like pop really soon. Star Metro, both Palisades and Star Metro, they both sent out letters saying um, use a credit card, get a job at Fredway, at Fredway, Fred Myers or Safeway or mm -hmm. Amazon, mm -hmm. um, and and so that really pissed their tenants off. 
I think we need to organize underneath these corporate owners and property managers so that we, um, and really focus the rent strike on them uh, because they have the money, right? They have $10 million to go put their name on a hospital um, Mm -hmm. and everything else. And, you know, it's the, it's the small mom and pops who, when you call for the huge rent strike, um, you know, they, and, and it's not just, it's not just the rent strike. It's every tenant protection that we ever fight for. It's, uh, you Mm. know, mom and pops come out and make it look like we're, you know, stealing their children in the night. Yeah. Right. Um, And, you know, know, some of those small mom and pops really aren't a whole lot different than us. Some of them, right. Some of them. Yeah. Then you have the people who introduce themselves as like, I'm a small mom and pop. I only own 10 buildings. Yeah. Right. I'm like, that's a lot more than my mom and pop. You're you're in, you're in the top, (laughs) you're in the 0.1%. I mean, this is what people need to understand when we talk about the 1%, the 99%, the the, the divisions, anybody who owns 10 buildings is in the 0.1% of the yeah. richest people in the United States. So there are people who own trailer parks in Wisconsin who are, uh, because they own the trailer park and charge everybody $400 a month to live in that trailer, uh, they make more money than 99.9% yeah. of Americans. But yeah. um, so we just got a, a few minutes here, but I just, uh, I just, I, I know we got votemargo.com right there on the, on oh, the yeah. screen, Votemargo. but com. people can go to the website. And one of the things that, that's really cool about the current moment, uh, well, I mean, not, not cool, but, but in terms of organizing on the internet, uh, there is this app called Reach, which I, having mm-hmm. been to a couple of your campaign uh, meetings, there's uh, this app that people can do a lot of organizing online uh, by contacting people, getting them registered to vote and getting them involved mm-hmm. with the campaign mm-hmm. and people need to go to votemargo.com and find out about that. And anybody mm-hmm. in the United States, if you're a citizen or a permanent resident, you don't need to be an Oregon or a Portland resident. You can donate to Margo's campaign and um, and you can find out about how to do that at votemargo.com. And, and please donate to Margo's campaign. Um, the, the, I don't take any um, donations over $250 and I only take donations from humans. So no um, no businesses, no entities, no non-humans at all. Um, and, uh, I only have the so ballots go out, uh, oh my gosh, ballots go out, um, on April 28th or uh, April 29th. My last day to fundraise is April 28th, which is in what, 10 days. What's today? Oh, 10 days. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I, you know, we've, we've, we've done some good fundraising and we've run a really solid campaign and, and in Portland, um, we're really lucky to have public financing, um, you know, that does some matching of donations, which is awesome. But uh, the ruling class absolutely does not want me to win. Um, that has become more and more clear over the last few days. The, um, the, the money is desperately needed for advertising and pushing my name out there to as many people as possible. In Portland, we have, we have 18 people running for this seat. Um, I'm definitely in uh, the top uh, four or five um, who have a chance of going on to the runoff, um, which will be special in, in a special election in August. But just just so folks understand the way that, um, uh, you know, we like to talk about hating our two party system. Um, and I agree. But when we vote by plurality, and by that, I mean, you get a ballot with 18 people on it, and you just pick one, the way the math shakes out is it is possible, it's theoretically possible for the top two people to have only 7% of the vote, um, you know, if, if everything else and, and they, them to go on to the general election yeah. and what that, and those top two, they could be two like Trumpers, right. Who just did real good mm. organizing in their like religious right wing community. Yep. Um, yep. And, uh, and, and they, so they could be the least preferred candidates of the other 85% of the election or electorate and then end up, you know, holding this seat. The difference between, you know, second and third place between going on and not going on could, could be just a few votes. I mean, um, with 18 candidates and five, you know, who have some level of, uh, well, five to eight have some level of name recognition and some organizing, um, you know, I have a really strong base and I have a strong message, um, but it is a base that is um, typically disenfranchised. You know, they're under-registered. Um, they don't, you know, they aren't as civically engaged because they have been trained to believe that um, this, you know, there's no point uh, that, you know, politicians don't, you know, knock on their doors or speak for them or care about them or, any, or ever, ever do anything that doesn't screw them. Um, and so I have to reach these people. I have to um, get them registered to vote. The last day to register to vote is in 10 days. Um, and really, because we can't knock doors, because we can't hold events, um, or I have to just 
advertise, 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 which unfortunately costs money. Um, and we, uh, I have right now, I have the most donors of anybody in my race. Okay. That's, that's, that's exciting. Mm-hmm. But the least amount of money oh, by hey. like 10 to $30,000 less than the, the two people closest to me in donors, because I said, I take donations up to $250. But most of my donations are five dollars, five to twenty dollars, yeah. um, because you know the Struggling people who are donating renters. to me are people yeah, paying renters. ninety percent the of people, their income on rent already. Yeah, yeah, and and that's I love that. I mean, I love that my campaign really truly is being funded by five dollar donors. Um, I just need more of them. <laughs> yeah, um, and uh, because you know I because we have to, you know, it, it just costs money to get the message out there. Um, yeah. I got interviewed by the Portland Tribune this week uh, for an endorsement interview, and I was very flattered because I was one of five that they picked. And the Tribune is, uh, they're a little, they're a little more conservative and libertarian leaning. And so I was like, wow, I feel like dignified. Like, I'm, I, like the fact that they dignified my candidacy by inviting me is kind of a thing. Yeah. Um, and I, and I, when they said like, what are you going to do about the necessary budget shortfalls you know, what, what are you going to cut? And I was like, we're not cutting any public services. We're going to tax the rich, you know, yeah. we're, all, we're all on board with not hoarding toilet paper and not hoarding face masks. Let's stop hoarding money, stop hoarding empty houses. Yeah. And, and they, so they just put out their endorsements and one of my opponents, so when, when they said, why are you running? He said, well, after commissioner fish died, um, you know, I've got 20 years of, uh, of or, uh, 20 years of experience making, you know, rich people really happy. He didn't say that, but um, he has lots of nonprofit uh, experience. And he said, and when Fish died, you know, a lot of people came knocking on my door saying the last grown up left the room. You've got to run. Oh, wow. And I said, are you kidding? You know, those, uh, those children are, first of all, women, you know, like mm-hmm. he's talking about the other, you know, there's three women yeah. and the mayor on council, you know, and they're, and they're radical women who are now yeah. being, you know, infantilized. Yeah. Um, and I, and I kind of, you know, I clapped back during my closing statement. Anyway, they released their endorsement. They endorsed that dude uh, who in response to my tax, the rich, he was like, we don't need to do class war right now. Oh, I really? mean, we're all in this together. Oh yeah. Right. No, we're losing the class and, war. <laughs> That's why they don't care about the class war. Yeah. And what was remarkable is in, you know, this particular, you know, Portland Tribune, normally they will talk about everybody they did interview and they'll be like, these are all competent and anybody would be a good choice, but this is our top choice or mm. this is why we didn't pick them. They're just not quite strong enough in these categories or whatever. They didn't even mention that they interviewed me. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that's, that, that's, that like, tells us what we're up against. Yeah. They didn't even like, they could have been like, we interviewed her, but she's a crazy radical. Don't vote for Margo Black. But they didn't even want to dignify my campaign that much because yeah. they know that I'm a threat. They know it. And, and they don't even want to mention your name because if they mention they, your name and anything about what your campaign, exactly. then they're giving you the kind of publicity that you need. Exactly. And the fact is that your name actually, has, the, you have more name yeah. recognition than most of these candidates because of your history as an activist. So the, mm-hmm. the best thing they can mm-hmm. do to, to avoid uh, promoting your campaign is not to mention you because, because you know, that if they mention you, it's good. It's going to be good publicity, no matter what they say exactly. about you, because they're going to exactly. say, oh, she's a class warrior and that's supposed to yeah. be negative. But you know, when, uh, right. Obama was running against, uh, when was it, uh, you know, he was, what was it, McCain or something. Every time they ca- they called Ob- Obama a socialist, his campaign, ra- his ratings went up. So they had to, you know, it's like his, the insults weren't working. But Margo, right. thank you so much for coming on my little live stream show. And um, we'll, we'll, I'll do all the publicity I can for your campaign from here thank in you. my little thank living you. room. But um, yes, thanks yeah, and so much. Yeah, if folks want to get involved, uh, especially get on the Reach app, we have to give you a special invitation to get into our campaign. So message the Facebook page. Um, and, uh, or you can email myself, margot at votemargot.com or outreach at votemargot.com um, uh, and uh, we'll get you hooked in and um, it's just it's relational organizing you just you just get in and then you start talking to literally the people you already know in the app about me as a candidate and it's, it's what uh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez used for her surprise upset victory so if we do it we can win but yeah. um, we have to do it you know I do have name recognition and I do have a base but there are really powerful, well-financed mm. people who really um, want 
to prevent me from winning. And ideally to, you know, they want, they, their hope is that they can see I get very few votes. And so they're going to turn out communities that will definitely vote against me um, to try to depress my vote to show that I, you know, that, that this is not, this is no, no time for socialism and class war. You know, they, Mm -hmm. you know, they also, they endorsed Ted Wheeler saying we might've given other candidates a look, but COVID-19, you know, we need a, we need a steady hand. And so he's, he's going to get the like wartime president, um, you know, sort of treatment. And I, you know, we're talking about unprecedented times right now. We need unprecedented solutions. We Mm -hmm. need unprecedented voices. We need unprecedented leaders. This is not the time to bring all the same people back to the table who've been at the table, um, building the systems and defending the systems that are um, crushing us right now. You know, this is, this is not the time for the same steady hands who literally created this crisis. It's time for the people who've been talking about the problems that this crisis is exposing and what ta- you know what it takes to fix them real time real you know real real world uh, before covid you know came in and and uh, made all of these crises trickle up yeah made everything more extreme so. yeah mm-hmm, mm-hmm. excellent go to votemargo.com vote for margo send money and sign up to help in the campaign and uh, you don't yes. even need to be from portland but yes. if you are, that's good. Thank you, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You. Yes. Thanks, we'll talk David. Talk to you soon. Thank you. I'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you all for joining me in this discussion with Portland Tenants United founder and Portland City Council candidate Margot Black. Please support her campaign financially. If you're a U.S. citizen or permanent resident, it doesn't matter what state you live in. Go to votemargo.com right there on the screen if you're watching and not listening in the podcast version later. But if you are, then you heard her pronounce her name uh, wrongly. So you can spell it. V-O-T-E-M-I-M-A-R-G-O-T. Margo with a T at the end, okay? VoteMargo.com. I I will be doing live stream broadcasts every weekday of next week. On Monday, I'll be doing a webinar on methods of survival for indie musicians in times of pandemic. On Tuesday, I'll be interviewing another one of my favorite songwriters, Seattle's Jim Page. If you want to check out previous interviews I've done, they're all up on my YouTube channel in the Discussions with David playlist. If you want to support my work, please go to davidrovics.com slash subscribe or uh, patreon.com slash davidrovics. And remember, votemargo.com. Hope to see you again soon here in the Matrix and sometime in the not-too-distant future again in the streets.